Crooked River, Chapter 19 On the day of the trial, we didn't leave until the sun was nearly above the tops of the trees, long after Pa and my brothers had left. It seemed as if we had been awake for hours, days even. I had tossed and turned all night, fearing what would happen. Laura looked worn to shadows, too. It had been awful hard listening to Pa and the men getting Indian John ready in the morning. I don't think me or Laura ever imagined they would use the soot from our own kettles and fat from the grease pot to paint stripes on Indian John's face. By the time they left with Indian John, both our stomachs were turned. Only Mercy had an appetite for her breakfast, while me and Laura didn't eat much more than a mouthful of ours. We washed the breakfast dishes in silence. I scrubbed the plates in small circles, while Laura dried them just as slow. After the dishes were, gone, were done, we took our time combing our hair, and I mended a torn hem in Laura's good dress twice. Finally, there wasn't any more time to be wasted, and we knew Pa would be looking for us. We pulled on our bonnets and tucked our hair carefully inside. Before we closed the cabin door, Laura took a pinch of camouflage from one of our tins and put it in her work bag. The sight of her bringing that along filled me with dread. Camouflage was for funerals and sitting up with somebody's remains. I brought you. I brought you back to your. I brought you back to your senses if you were overcome. I asked Laura why she would take it to the trial, and she said there was no telling what we would see that day. No telling at all. Holding tight to Mercy's little hands, we made our way down the road toward the settlement. White gnats flew in clouds around us, and we had to keep a sharp eye for snakes curled up in the warm dirt. Where are we going? Mercy kept on asking, and Laura kept on answering, hush. As we drew closer to the settlement, I figured we would surely hear the trial. But we didn't hear a word until we came out of the woods and saw the silent crowd of spectators gathered around Mr. Perry's store. I had never seen so many people in one place in all my life. Not for Independence Day, or a cabin raising, or a funeral either. They didn't fit in the shade of the big tree, but spilled out in every direction. Lord, look at the people, Laura gasped. Reb, look at all the people. The crowd sat on all manner of things. Wagon boxes, planks, upended logs, and fancy chairs. Whatever they could find or bring, I supposed... Around the edges, there were bed quilts and blankets scattered across the scrackled grass, filled with women and children. As me and Laura drew closer, we caught sight of the jurymen. They sat on two rows of planks near the front of the crowd. There were twelve of them, and I noticed a few faces I knew among them. Our neighbor, Mr. Evans, the shoemaker, Hiram Nash, Old Vinegar Bigger, the rough Hoadley brothers, who were rumored to be overly fond of drinking whiskey, slings, Mr. Holly and a half a dozen others. Most of the men looked mighty uncomfortable in their good suits of clothes, with their faces still sunburnt from planning, planting. I could see their pocket handkerchiefs moving up to wipe their foreheads. Judge James R. Noble was next to the jury. He sat behind a table that was placed on a raised box. I studied him. He wasn't exactly like the picture I'd drawn in my mind. I'd imagined someone tall and white-haired, someone who would make everyone take notice and tremble. But Judge Noble was a round and fleshy-faced sort of man. His brown hair had retreated far back, leaving a wide white forehead that caught the sun of, shine of the sun, and his black robes hung in loose folds around him. When we reached the edge of the crowd, the judge was talking to someone sitting on the right side of him in what seemed to be the witness chair. The man was dressed in, dark, in a dark suit of clothes, and he had a good brown hat resting in his lap. It gave me a start to realize that the man sitting there, being spoken to by the judge himself, was my very own Pa. 